spirit of God in this place this morning. Hallelujah. Truly the Lord is good and he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Can we just stand and reverence God this morning? Hallelujah. We give honor this morning to our pastors, Pastor Lamont and Pastor Mia. Amen. To all of the ministers, all the elders here that serve at LTM, we honor you this morning. <coughs> doing children's church today? We not? We don't have to. Oh, y'all are? Okay. If, <laughs> if we're doing children's church, we are dismissed. <laughs> come back. Just come back. Give them a few minutes to go ahead and just exit the sanctuary. <clears throat> Amen. I give honor to my husband and my children that are on their way on the other side. And I want to take my time this morning. Is that all right? Hallelujah. I said the Super Bowl is over. <laughs> Amen. I want to lift up this morning um, Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'm going to lift up verses 1 through 14. Ezekiel 37. Verses 1 through 14. When you have it, say amen. 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 The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will Put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. Cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place in you your own, I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken and perform it, saith the Lord. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. Father, we ask that you would speak to the hearts and the minds of your people this morning. And I will be so careful, God, to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said amen. 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 This morning I want to preach from the topic, it's coming together. It's coming together. When we speak of the omnipotence of God, we speak of his power and his sovereignty. We understand that to be omnipotent translates to mean all-powerful. Thus, we know that God has no equal. We know that there are no constraints when it comes to his decisions. He has the power and the authority to do what he decides to do, when he decides to do, however he decides to do it. It is important, however, as it relates to the sovereignty of God that we understand and put omnipotence in proper context. God is not able to do absolutely whatever he decides. He is only able to do everything that is consistent with his character. In all of his sovereignty, God will never act in a way that is inconsistent with his character. The Bible says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent has he said and will he not do. Or has he spoken and will he not make good? According to James 1.13, God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And so to understand this is to understand that God can do anything he wills to do in that it is consistent with who he is. God is not like man. We know that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are are not our ways for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are the ways of the lord higher than ours and so we know that there are no time restraints we know that there are times when it's hard to to comprehend the ways of god there are times when we don't fully understand what god is doing and if we can be honest there are times when we do not always agree with his methods There are moments when we look back over our lives that we would have answered our prayers a little differently. We would have showed up and answered a little sooner. We say he may not come when you want him to, but but he's always on time. But whose time are we referring to? Because God is timeless in his own being. His eternity is seen all throughout scripture. God always is. He has always existed. He is the Alpha and Omega, saith the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the Almighty. No one can change or challenge the sovereignty of God. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Suggesting that there was an appointed time in which Martha believed that that she needed him to show up on her behalf. There are times, if we are honest this morning, that God doesn't always show up when we want him to. There are times when it feels like God waits for things to get messy beyond repair. And even then, he still does not show up when we want him to. Have you ever sat in a season where it no longer even feels like a season? You're starting to question and wonder, God, has this 
become my new normal? Have you been in a situation, a season? Have you ever experienced life in a way that caused you to question your own sanity? You felt stuck in cycles year after year. Same old, same old. How, oh, how frustrating it must be to know that you have potential. You seek potential. You believe in potential, but yet you have not yet tapped into your potential. Because you constantly choose this rebellious cycle of disobedience. Here, you are stuck existing, breathing, but it doesn't feel like you're living. Moving, but not going anywhere. It seems like when you take two steps forward, you get knocked back ten. Have you ever been blindsided by life? And it caused you to look at where you are and say, God, nothing about where I am looks like what you spoke concerning my future. God, this don't look like what you decreed concerning my marriage. This doesn't look like what you spoke over my life. God, Jesus said that I've come to have a life and life more abundantly, but it don't look like it's given what it was supposed to give. But can we just be honest enough? this morning to admit that sometimes it wasn't all God. Sometimes it wasn't always life's circumstances that hit me off guard. But there were moments that you played a role in your own stagnation. You contributed to the cycle. You made some bad decisions along the way. Have you ever found yourself frustrated with yourself that when you will to do good evil was always present is there anybody in here this morning that can admit uh, i said some things that i probably should not have said i, I done made some detours I, I made some turns along the way i, I made some decisions uh, without first consulting god uh, can anybody be honest this morning and say it wasn't all life it wasn't all circumstances there were times and seasons that it was me I contributed to the stagnation I contributed to the cycle I contributed to feeling stuck there were times and seasons that it was me you 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 didn't always choose the high road there were times where where you said something that you probably you shouldn't have said you you didn't always choose the soft answer that turns away wrath there were times you didn't always give grace there were times when you clapped back so can we just be honest this morning that sometimes it isn't always life that causes us to fall into dry seasons Sometimes it's our poor choices. Your own choices betrayed you. Your own flesh led you into what feels like Babylonian captivity. Here you are in exile on spiritual life support. Feeling like a foreigner in a strange land. Everything around you feels dry and lifeless. And, and you're wondering, God, when is it going to be my day of restoration? And so here lies the problem with straddling the fence. Here lies the problem with being indecisive concerning who you will serve. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. The message Bible says, once people have been the light, gotten a taste of heaven, and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they personally experience the sheer goodness of God's word and the powers breaking in on us if then they turn their backs on it washing their hands of the whole thing well they can't start all over as if nothing happened it's impossible you have come into the house of God and you have experienced the glory of God and you prayed for deliverance and he showed up and he delivered. You prayed for peace and it rested on you. 
you tasted and saw that the Lord was good, but still you were straddling the fence. And the Bible says it's as if you crucify him all over again. It makes it difficult once you tasted of his goodness and then you turn your back on the presence of God. It makes it almost impossible to put your mind back in a frame of repentance. And so I know what it was to be in a backslidden condition. That's why I don't play with God. That's why I don't straddle the fence. That's why I let my yay be yay and my nay. Nay, I, I can't afford to straddle. I can't afford to be lukewarm because it takes too long to get back to where you are in God. God, it takes a long time. I know what it is to sit in the house of God and you watch people with their hands lifted up and you're watching the tears roll down their face and you're sitting there saying, God, if I can only just feel your presence again. God, if I can just only feel the weight of your glory again. I know what it is to be in the house of God and still be in a backslidden condition. We often preach the parable about the prodigal son. But before you get to the parable about the prodigal son, the Bible talks about the lost coin where the woman, she loses her coin in the house. She, she don't got to go far off to find the coin. The Bible says she sweeps her house clean because the coin is lost in the house. And if I can be honest, Minister Reggie, I'm concerned about the state of the church. I'm concerned about the universal body of Christ because don't you know that you can preach and still be lost in the house? Don't you know that you can serve and still be lost in the house? Don't you know that you can sing and prophesy and still be lost in the house? And so if we are not careful, we will find ourselves lost in the house. So let me pose, let me pose a question this morning. What happened to the zeal for the things of God? What happened to your hunger and your thirst for righteousness. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? You used to be excited about Bible study. You used to be excited about Sunday morning service. Now you come in late if you come at all. And now on Wednesday nights, when we look around the room, the sanctuary is oftentimes filled with the leaders. But I remember there was a time in a season when Bible study looked like Sunday morning worship. When the church was full on Wednesday night, I remember there was a time when we would have intercessory prayer before Bible study and the church would be packed. Let me ask you a question this morning. Where has your zeal for the things of God gone? Being in the in-between with God is dangerous because it will cause conflict within your soul. It will cause you to feel dry while everything around you is well watered. God, you said out of my belly was supposed to flow rivers of living water. But it feels like I have nothing left in me to give. 
And so if that's you this morning, I just need you to hold on because it's coming together. I know everything looks dry. I know it looks lifeless. I, I know it looks hopeless. I know it looks like things are going to always be like this. But the devil is a liar. This is the year of committed consecration. This is the year that you get your fight back. This is the year that you get your zeal back. This is the year that you recommit your heart to the Lord. This is the year that you stop running from the call and the mantle and the mandate that God has placed on your life. This is the year of committed consecration and so I hear the Lord asking a question this morning can these bones live Ezekiel was carried away into exile into Babylonian captivity and on his 30th birthday while most priests by 30 are getting ready to start their ministry in the temple, the Lord calls Ezekiel into the office of a prophet. And God sends him to a rebellious people. And he tells Ezekiel to his face, I'm going to send you to a people and they ain't going to listen. He said, I'm going to send you to a stiff necked people and you still going to have to declare my word. And when you get finished prophesying, I'm going to tell you to your face, they not going to listen. Have you ever been challenged with the situation? feels like the situation is just stubborn that the more you pray the worse it gets the more you fast the harder it gets the more you confess out of your mouth the more this thing starts to look like nothing that you confessed mm, God. but God being sovereign has to make good on his word. So he sends Ezekiel to those that are in Babylonian exile. And he tells them it's time now for judgment to be carried out on Israel due to their continuous rebellion and idolatry. He begins to execute judgment and he begins with the elders in the temple. He takes Ezekiel up into a vision and he places him in the temple and he says, Ezekiel, look, there is a hole in the wall. And he tells Ezekiel to begin to dig in the hole. And when Ezekiel dug in the hole, he saw a door and Ezekiel enters the temples and Behold, he sees in the temple, the elders uh, are worshiping all kinds uh, of animals and, and, and creeping things. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, do they not see the abomination that they are committing in the temple? And the elders said, because we are in Babylonian captivity, the Lord does not see us. He said, Ezekiel, they said, I do not see. So he begins to execute judgment. And he begins with the elders in the temple. He deals with the false prophets and, and the princes in Babylon who sat and gave wicked counsel. And so, yes, God is gracious. Yes, God is merciful. But God is also just. And he is also sovereign. And if we as a people don't make a decision as to where we stand concerning the kingdom of heaven, surely God is getting ready to spew you out of his mouth. And so if we think it does not matter how we serve God, 
I just want to remind you this morning that the sons of Aaron took it upon themselves to offer up strange fire to the Lord. Fire that the Lord did not authorize. Fire that the Lord did not command. And the Bible says that fire blazed from God and consumed them and they died in the presence of God. We have lost our reverence for the spirit of God. If you think it does not matter how you handle the presence of God, then I need to remind you this morning that Uzzah reached out to catch the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. He just wanted to keep the Ark from falling. But because he was not authorized to handle the Ark of the Covenant, the Bible says that God struck him down dead because he handled the Ark of the Covenant in an irreverent way. And so if you think it does not matter how we handle the sacraments of God, I come to remind you, you said that he is the God of yesterday and today and forevermore. Is he not the same God? If you think how we live as a body of believers does not matter, should I remind you? And so after his judgment, I'm grateful this morning that God is not like man. Can I tell you that the anger of the Lord does not last? <laughs> when we quote Isaiah 55, when we say his ways are not our ways, his ways are higher than ours. When you study that text, what God was actually talking about was his heart of forgiveness. He was saying that I pardon sins in a way that man does not. God has a way of throwing your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. But man has a way of constantly reminding you of the error of your ways. God said my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, aren't you so glad that we serve a God this morning? That even when we fall short of his glory, his anger does not kindle always. Now, if you're perfect, you can't get excited about his grace and his mercy. But folk like me, I need grace. I, I need his mercy. Day by day, it's new mercies that we see every day. I need every day worth the mercy. Because we think that because folk holding the microphone that they cross every T and that they dot every I. But can I tell you, we're just held at a higher standard. I wish I could do some of what the church folk was doing. But I'm held accountable for how I live. One day I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account for every idle word that's ever come out of my mouth. And so if you think it does not matter how we handle the presence of God, if you think it does not matter how we handle the sacraments, if you think you just going to come in here and hop on an instrument, if you think you just going to come in here and serve communion, if you think <laughs> it matters how we reverence God. So after his judgment, the Lord begins to release a prophetic word concerning the blessings and renewal of Israel. In chapter 37, the Lord carries Ezekiel out in the spirit and he sets him in the midst of the valley full of bones. And he asks him a question, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel responds by saying, oh Lord God, 
you know. Yeah. Ezekiel acknowledges the omniscience of God. Yeah, yeah. That God fully knows himself and all things, mm -hmm. actual and possible, in one simple and eternal act. God doesn't only know the actual, but he also knows all things that are possible. Ezekiel responds to God and he says, if it is possible for these dry bones to live, God, only you know. The Lord then says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. He first commands the dry bones to hear. <laughs> he first commands the dry bones to hear the word of the Lord. And John 8, 47 says, whoever is of God and belongs to him hears the truth of God's word. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God and you are not in fellowship with him. So one of the first signs that you are no longer in fellowship with God is that you can no longer hear. When you can no longer hear his word, when his word no longer pricks your heart, when you can hear a word and, and it does not cause you to change your mind, when you can hear a word and it does not convict your spirit, that's a red flag that you have already lost fellowship. And so I, I can't, I can't speak for nobody else, but, but when I can't hear, I get agitated. When I can't hear, I get irritated. And you got to understand that the tactic of the enemy is to cause so much chaos and distraction so that the voice of God becomes dull in your hearing. And many of us have gotten comfortable with no longer hearing the voice of God. We rather hear motivational speeches. We would much rather hear emotionalism being preached across the pulpit. But when I can no longer hear the voice of God, I get irritated because I can't afford not to hear God. I can't afford not to hear him. I can't afford not to hear him. And some of us have gotten comfortable with not hearing. But how can you prophesy and you can't hear? How can you preach and you can't hear? What are we preaching? And what are we prophesying if we can't? If we can't hear. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4.29, he says that you ought to seek the Lord with all your heart. We have lost our seek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That if I can't hear, I got to seek. Because if he ain't under the bed, then maybe he in the bathroom. And if he ain't in the bathroom, then maybe he in the... We have lost our ability to seek God until we find him. He said, I'm a rewarder of them that diligently seeks after me. You done prayed one time and you ain't heard nothing. So you stop praying. That ought to be an indication in your spirit that you got to go and dig a little deeper. Because I can't hear. You got to seek. So then he says to Ezekiel, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I sense in the room this morning that many of us need a refilling of the spirit of God. Paul asked a question in Acts 19. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What 
what does that mean? That means that I can accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and still not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I remember when I was 17 and I got, I got saved and I got baptized. And I remember at the time it was Minister Mia. And after I got baptized in water, she said, now pray and ask God to baptize you in his spirit. And I remember asking God in about three weeks after my water baptism, I was speaking in tongues uncontrollably and it just began to flow out of me. Can I tell you, if you think you're going to make it to heaven without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to make it. No, 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 no. You're not going to make it without the Holy Ghost. You're not going to make it. Because if I didn't have the Holy Ghost, I would have slapped about five people already. Okay. Because y'all, y'all real, y'all sanctified. Y'all saved. Y'all good and saved. <laughs> oh God. If, 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 if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, I would have been, I would have been in my bed. Then I would have been in your bed. And then, okay, y'all, y'all, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> y'all, y'all sanctified like that. Okay. If I didn't have the Holy Spirit, you talking about somebody that hold grudge? Forgive who? For, forgive who? For, forgive who? Pray for who? Intercede for who? Fast for who? The Bible says that Ezekiel prophesied to the bones and the bones started coming together but God said but it's still not living because it still does not have my breath yet and so what we are seeing now in the body of Christ is we are seeing a lot of walking spiritually dead the walking dead is amongst us because we do not operate and we do not have the Holy Spirit. You think you're going to make it in without them? Let me see. Let me see. Because I don't like to go to Walmart without the Holy Spirit. I, I, I don't like the text without the Holy Spirit. Because there are times where the Holy Spirit had to tell me, delete that. Don't, 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 don't send that. There were times, God, when the Holy Spirit had to check my emails. And he, yes, Lord. And he sent a friend that said, ah, take that out. Take, take that out. Have you ever went to communicate and the Holy Spirit said, ah, you, you about to mess this thing up? Because if you leave it up to me and my devices, <laughs> I'm, 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 going, I'm prone to mess this thing up. <laughs> I, <I'm, laughs> Paul said, I was chief sinner. I have a way of messing some things up. But if it had not been for the Holy Spirit. So, so Ezekiel begins to prophesy. Let me just say this. If you've been struggling in your walk with the Lord. Now, now I've been saved a good about 17 years now, right? And so where I am today is not where I was 17 years ago. And, 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 and it ought not be. Hmm? Okay? I, I should not be still drinking milk after 17 years of salvation. So, so let me put this plug out there for you. If you are struggling in sanctification right if if, if I'm, I'm not i'm not talking we all we all fall short we all i'm not i'm not i'm not talking about that i'm talking about you are in a, a, a habitual cycle of sin right hmm. can i just suggest this is just a suggestion that maybe when you got saved that there is a possibility that you were never sealed with the holy spirit There's a possibility. And you're saying, God, 
I, I, I want to do good. I really will to do good. But, but if you're struggling after 10 and, and, and 20 years of being saved, and you've been in the church, and you know scripture, but you can't live nothing, you, you can't live nothing, you can't live Jesus wet. You can't, you can't live nothing. Let me just suggest. I'm going to tell you now, when, when, they, when they call for water baptism again, I'm going to be in the line. I'm going to get baptized and dipped all over again. Because I want I, I want to be filled again. Ah, hallelujah. I want to be filled with his spirit again. I want to be filled with his presence again. So let me, let me just, let me just, I'm just make that suggestion. It's just a suggestion. And it's something to think about. That perhaps you just don't have the seal of the Holy Spirit. Because Ezekiel begins to prophesy. And the bones begin to respond. The Bible says the bones begin to rattle. And he says the sinews begin to come now and they begin to connect the bone. And then the Bible says he begins to prophesy again. And the flesh now becomes to cover the bones. And the Bible says as he begins to prophesy again, the skin now comes. And now what we are seeing is the flesh and the skin begin to cover the dry bones. But in all the covering, God said prophesy to the breath now. to the rock of God he said call the breath of God from the four winds he said now when the spirit of God begins to fill the dry bones now he says arise O army of Israel a lot of times we dance and we shout over this text but understand, God was prophesying revival to the house of Israel because he said to them, when I take you out of Babylonian captivity, he says, I'm going to take away your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. What does that mean? It means that God is going to give you a heart that responds to his word and responds to his spirit that his word can now penetrate your heart. That the thing that did not used to convict you, now all of a sudden you'll feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The sin that you were comfortable living in, now all of a sudden, because God gave you a, a heart of flesh, something will rise up in you and say, I can't keep living like this. I can't keep lying in Lodabar. So can I just tell you this morning, it's going to come together. I'm speaking from a place of, I remember when I was so hungry for the things of God. I said, God, if you just let me get back to where I was this time, God, and I kept my commitment to the, to the Lord. I don't shadow the fence. I'm not on the wall. I've made a decision because it costs too much. It costs too much. Can I tell y'all what y'all already know? To folk that straddle the fence, y'all miserable anyway. No, 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 no. You miserable. You miserable. Because at this point, you've already identified that God called you to something greater than yourself. You think you're going to ignore the call on your life? You think you're going to ignore the mandate on your life? You miserable living in the in-between place. So you might as well submit. This all I got. I ain't, ain't, ain't nothing in the world for me. This all I got. Ain't nothing in hell for me. This all I got. This all I got. This it. This it. Because the truth of the matter is, it's miserable. No, 
no, no, no, no. You, oh, it's fun. No, sin ain't fun. It's tormenting. Sin will torment you. Because you now become a slave. You become bondage to something that you don't even want to really do anyway. You don't told yourself I'm going to stop drinking. But the truth of the matter is you can't. You know why? Because you didn't even realize that you were slave to sin. You said, I'm going to stop fornicating, but you can't. You know why? Because you did not realize that your flesh dictates your next move. And the only way to break the yoke of sin is to become a slave to Christ. You thought you was going to do it on your own. You can't. You thought you was just going to live this righteous life on your own without the Holy Spirit. You can't. This is why I serve him. Because he is the only one that delivered me. He's the only one. He was the only one that knew all of my dirt and loved me anyway. He the only one, Brandon, that knew how messed up I really was. And he called my name anyway. He the only one that has been gracious and patient even when I wasn't patient with myself. So if you hear this morning, you said, God, I, I really do want to live this thing out. I know, because I did too. God, I really want to, I want to be sold out for real. I know, I know, because I did too. And I'm here now. No goodness of my own. But because of his grace and because of his mercy, some things are coming together. The dry bones going to live again. You going to rejoice again. You going to have joy again. You going to have peace again. So I want to want to make this plea this morning. Because can we be honest? The days are evil. And if you go back out there and you think you're just going to come back, you might not make it back. You got a servant while you got a mind. While he has not turned you over to a reprobate mind. Altar is open. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins. I want to offer salvation this morning because it's not going to get easier. The enemy just going to find other ways to keep you in bondage. And if you haven't already, you're going to start doing the stuff that you said you would never do. You're here, but you're saved. You're saved. You said, I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know you're not consistent concerning the things of God. You say, God, I want to get my seek back. I want to chase after you. I want the zeal of when I first believed. I want you to come this morning.
to speak this morning to the people that said, I'm not ready to come yet. I'll tell you something. There were times I didn't come because I didn't want to disappoint God. 